Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the webinar, How to Create an Inclusive Virtual Learning Environment, given by Dr. Alexandra Setlovskaya, Associate Director of the C. Roland Christensen Center for Teaching and Learning at Harvard Business School. I'm Dr. Rodriguez Ardura, in Rodriguez Ardura and I'm a professor of marketing at the UOC the Open University of Catalonia, and the director of the UOC's Digital Business Research Group. This webinar is aimed at scholars, lecturers, and institutions who seek to make the most of the diversity of students they have in their online classrooms, and to hear about the strategies to build virtual learning atmospheres that are truly inclusive. The webinar has been organized by the UOC's Digital Business Research Group in collaboration with the UOC's Area of Globalization and Cooperation and a consortium of universities and institutions that participate in e-inclusion, a research project funded by the European Union Erasmus Plus program. Even though the webinar is being held in English, as you can see, you can use simultaneous interpretation into Catalan or Spanish by switching to either of these languages on the platform. Also, you can select translation into Spanish sign language. The structure of the session is going to be the following. We are going to have a very short opening by Dr. Angels Fito, UOC's Vice President for Competitiveness and Employability, by Marika Sludman, Associate Professor at the VU University in Amsterdam and Director of the E-Inclusion Project, and by myself. Immediately afterwards, Dr. Alexandra Setloskaya is going to give her a speech for about 40 minutes, followed by a 15-minute QIN section. Of course, in this last section, all of your questions, comments, and suggestions are more than welcome. Please, Feel free to raise them through the chat on the platform in any language you wish, while mentioning your name and university affiliation. To build a productive debate and make it evolve, we would greatly appreciate if, if the chat could be mainly used for these purposes. So greetings and acknowledgement remarks are kept to the bare minimum. Now, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker today. Dr. Angel Fito. 
Dr. Fito, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Rodriguez Ardura. On behalf of the UOC, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you and thank you for being virtually with us today at this seminar about how to create an inclusive virtual learning environment. The Open University of Catalonia is, an, as an online university, is by definition an open and global university with all the challenges that this entails. Our virtual classrooms have more than uh, 142 different countries, so we have to afford different physical, familiar and professional conditions. So as an institution, we have to be prepared to manage this diversity we have to be prepared at least to take advantage of all this value. With this purpose, the university is continuously working on this commitment to care for diversity. We are implementing a digital transformation plan where one of these, uh, its main access is the access gap. We have also formed a diversity working group and we are one uh, of the partners of the e-inclusion project, which has the support of the European Commission and whose mission is to provide equitable education opportunities to students in online, blended and hybrid environments. We also have programs such as study grants for refugees or virtual mobilities with international universities. And we have around 1,700 people with some kind of disability and our goal is that all our students, no matter this uh, situation, feel represented and with a feeling of belonging at our community. We have to guarantee their study conditions and a successful academic career. At the same time, in order to face this diversity, we are training our team, providing them with the tools so their teaching can be also diverse. At least society has evolved. We know that not everyone starts from the same conditions and according to what SDG4 advocates, we have to guarantee a learning environment guided by equality and equity. This is absolutely necessary to make effective our mission. So thank you very much again for helping us in achieving it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fito. Now I'll turn to Dr. Marika Slutman. So Open University of Catalonia, thank you so much for hosting this event. So how can we as universities make our online education more inclusive? It has received quite some attention nowadays. In traditional offline face-to-face -face education, inclusion is a challenge. It's hard to make universities accessible to every student, regardless of their identity, background, skin color, or physical and neurological abilities. And it's not only about accessibility, but it can also be hard to make education engaging for every student and to make sure that every student experiences belonging and flow. It can be hard to recognize all needs of every student and all talents too. Also in virtual and online educational settings, this is a challenge. We have seen this in the context of the Corona pandemic. The sudden shift from all offline education to online education has widened gaps between minority and majority students. In this abrupt emergency situation, it has proven to be a challenge to create online education that is accessible and in which every student feels engaged and recognized. After all, technological resources vary between students, as does their home situation. And the lack of face-to-face -face contact, contact has often negatively affected flow and feelings of belonging. At the same time, technology and online settings offer endless opportunities for flexibility in time and space and variation in methods and materials, learning materials. So how can we embrace these opportunities while compensating for the challenges that result from the lack of this face-to-face -face context? And here, we can learn a lot from open universities like the Open University of Catalonia because their educational design at the core is based on the specific opportunities and challenges of online education and virtual education. In the Erasmus e-inclusion consortium, we work together on this topic of inclusive online education with institutions in the Netherlands, Belgium, Poland, Malta and Spain, including the Open University of Catalonia. And we develop online tools in this year and in the year to come um, 
we develop online tools that support teachers in making their online education more inclusive. Hence, we're incredibly interested in the views and lessons of Professor Svetlovskaya. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing uh, Professor Svetlovskaya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Slotman. Now I would like to briefly introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Alexandra Setlovskaya. Dr. Setlovskaya is a well-regarded researcher in the field of diversity who has extensively published on social identity, public and private aspects of the self, gender differences, and sexual identity in the workplace prejudice against people who are assumed to carry a disease and perception mechanisms that diminish anti-immigration anti attitudes, among other topics. She lectures at the Harvard Business School on self and identity and is associate director of the C. Roland Christensen Center for Teaching and Learning at Harvard University. There, she conducts research and innovation projects on management, education, and pedagogies that support participant-centered learning. Through her work, Dr. Setloskaya is helping lecturers at Harvard and else everywhere, uh, everywhere to build an, a nurture, safe, and inclusive learning environment that intellectually challenges students and draw their engagement. And now, Dr. Setloskaya, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you so much, first of all, for organizing the webinar and of course for inviting me and thank you all so much for joining us now or watching us in recording, perhaps both. And I have to say that I am very excited, hopefully you can tell, about being here virtually as we think and talk about this question of how to create an inclusive virtual learning environment. And as we explore this question, I think it might be useful for us to step back and think about our own experience here, now. I think it's incredible powerfully that we are able to come together from very different parts of our lives, very different parts of the world. Maybe that's also a good time for us to stop and thank our interpreters for facilitating our virtual learning. And very similarly, as we think about virtual learning for our students. As Marika already mentioned, it allows us to bring together students with very diverse experiences and very diverse perspectives. And the question becomes, how do we embrace and build on this incredible student diversity to enhance everyone's learning? And to do that, we need to be very purposeful as we think about how do we make students feel seen as individual learners and valued members of our learning community. We'll come back to these questions over and over again, hopefully not just in this webinar, but throughout our time together. And we know from research, my own research, other research out there, that is incredibly important to create a strong sense of a learning community and make sure that students feel included in that community, that they feel a sense of belonging to share their diverse experiences and to share their diverse perspectives and ultimately enhance everyone's learning through this engaged participation. So what do I mean by virtual learning participation? It can be synchronous, Again, using us as an example right now, we are all now joining live this webinar. We are participating synchronously. And when I say participating, I so hope that you will participate too, even though I cannot see you. Going back to this question, do you feel engaged? I wanna make sure that you are able to ask questions as Ima mentioned through chat. I'm very much looking forward to engaging with your questions. We can also participate asynchronously, if you're watching us in recording. First of all, hello to everyone who is watching us in recording. I know that you cannot ask questions that will be immediately answered during this webinar, but I wanna invite you to reach out after the webinar and I'd be happy to engage asynchronously. And of course, that goes for everyone, even if you are with us live, you might continue reflecting. I hope you continue reflecting. And you might have other questions, you might have other thoughts you'd like to share 
So I really want to extend this invitation to all of you to reach out afterwards and we can continue having this conversation. And we also have hybrid. I know hybrid has many meanings. It picked up many more meanings during the pandemic. What I mean here is just different ways of combining synchronous and asynchronous learning and being very thoughtful of how we're doing that. To give an example, I'll actually draw on the course that I'm teaching on self and identity in my mention, this course that I'm teaching at Harvard Extension School. And it also gone through transition that Marika mentioned. I started in one form of hybrid and once the pandemic came, I've transitioned to a different hybrid context. So before the pandemic, and I should note that I've been teaching it now for five years and be its fifth year this uh, winter in January, when I started teaching this course, I was physically present in the classroom. And I had students who would join also physically in person in the classroom. And simultaneously, I also had students join live sessions virtually. We use on Zoom, I know others use different platforms, but the idea would be that some of my students would be present in person, others would be present remotely. And we had another group of students who would be watching completely on demand in recording on their own time. And they would participate through what we call class annotations. I'll talk more about what that means, but basically it's a synchronous chat that would be available. Then when pandemic hit, we've moved online and that's where I've been teaching for the past couple of years. And yet again, it was a hybrid setting because some of my students were joining live sessions. Now they're all online, I was online with them. And we had another group of students who continued watching our class recordings and again participating through class annotations, this asynchronous chat. And my course involved a completely asynchronous component throughout these years where all students could engage with each other regardless of how they were joining class sessions. These are just some examples of hybrid. You might have others. I hope you have others. But the basic idea, again, as we're thinking about synchronous or asynchronous or a combination of these elements, what's important is that I wanna go back to these questions with which I've started. How do we purposefully and thoughtfully embrace and build on student diversity to enhance learning? And again, how do we make sure that students feel seen as individual learners and valued members of our learning community? We can think about this on different levels. We can think about it on the programmatic level, but because I know we have a short period of time together today, I will focus on our course as our unit of analysis for today as we think about student engagement. Again, going back to Marika, who talked explicitly about the importance of engaging all students and how can we be doing that? Again, thinking about it from the course perspective, what can we be doing before our course even starts? What can we be doing on the very first day of class? And what can we be doing outside of classes, both immediately before or after class, or between classes. And as I talk about this, I'll be drawing, you'll see on my teaching experiences, on my research, on other research that exists um, in the field as we think about what can we be doing. So let's start before our course even starts. What can we be doing? And what I'd like to do is reach out to my students with a welcome email. And as the name, suggests I welcome all students into our course. We know words matter. And I'm using the word our very purposefully to signal and start building the sense of one learning community. And I also ask students to respond through email with their brief introductions. I ask them to share with me a bit about their backgrounds as we know. Students can join from just the way we're here, very different parts of their lives, very different parts of the world. I'm also very interested to learn what brings them to this course. Why are they interested 
in taking this course. I know some of us might be teaching required courses. I still like to think that there are other reasons why students take the course. And I'd love to know what those reasons are. And I ask students to share their objectives for our semester together. First of all, it's helpful for me to know what are their objectives. And it also has students reflecting on their objectives. If they haven't started yet, it moves them from passive recipients of knowledge, of information, to active learners in charge of their learning. What are their objectives for our time together? And then I respond to their introductions with a brief but personalized note. Let's stay on this for a second because I know this can be very time consuming, especially if we teach large courses. My class is around 100 students. I recognize that some of you might be teaching much larger courses. But again, the challenge is, as Marika alluded to it in the introduction, yes. Virtual learning allows us to bring students together, but it's also very easy for students to feel simply as tiles on screen. If we're talking about synchronous live sessions, it might be even easier for them to feel completely in the shadow if they're not even seen. Again, reflecting our experience right now, if you're watching us live, I know you're there. I appreciate you being there. I also am very deeply aware that I cannot see any of you. I hope you're still engaged by recognizing some of the challenges of making students feel seen as individual learners and also making them feel valued as members of our learning community. So I respond with personalized notes, acknowledging them as individual learners. And I also end my note by encouraging and inviting them to contribute to our learning, being valid members of our learning community. Hopefully now you're seeing the theme that's starting to emerge here. It also allows me to learn a little bit about student backgrounds and names. Even before this webinar began, we were able to chat a little bit and discover and explore this role of our names. We know certainly from our personal experiences, we also know from research out there cognitive research, social psychological research, names, our own names, critically important to us. There is a study that's entitled, How Do I Love Thee? Let me count the J's because the author's name starts with a J. It's a play on the poem that starts with, How Do I Love Thee? Let me count the ways. And the study illustrates the power of our names, that we have affinity toward others, whose names are similar to our names. And even now you might be thinking, you know, from people in your life, who of them might have names similar to ours? Names matter, especially if we have international students. Again, creating a sense of inclusion, creating a sense of belonging for all students means that we are pronouncing their names correctly. That might take time. And I'm very explicit with my students when I ask them to correct me if I am mispronouncing their names. That's important. Now, on the very first day of class, going back to welcome, how do we welcome students? If we're teaching fully online, that means making eye contact with a camera. Again, I'm not sure whether you sensing that I'm trying to make eye contact with you it might be challenging, it feels unnatural, but that's our way to connect. It's even more challenging if we are teaching in a hybrid space where some students are in front of us in person. We know again from research in cognitive science, we get pulled toward people who are in front of us. And it's very easy, it's incredibly easy to forget to look up on the screen, to look up at the camera, to acknowledge students who are joining us virtually or who are watching completely in recording. So nonverbals, this idea of eye contact matters. Also verbal, how do we welcome students? Similarly with inclusive participation practices, 
do we remember about students who are not just in front of us? Students who are joining either virtually or, or are watching in recording. Instructions, even here now, I explicitly ask that if you are watching us in recording to reach out to me after the webinar. And of course, again, it doesn't be just for people who are watching us in recording. I hope all of you feel empowered to reach out afterwards. But recognizing that there might be differences in instructions. And so when I teach the course, I would pause and I would say, if you're watching us in recording, please stop the video and do X, Y, and Z with student participation. And I'll talk more about class annotations that I've referenced a couple of times, but even during live sessions, especially if I'm in hybrid setting where some students are physically present, other students are joining remotely. I tend to, in the first day of class especially, start by calling on someone who is joining remotely. I should say that my classes are all very participant-centered, very discussion-based, to make sure that we really utilize the power of our diverse perspectives. And I call on students who are on screen to signal that nobody's a passive observer. We are all active participants and we're all contributing to our individual and collective learning. And I also invite a dialogue between students who are joining remotely and students who are physically present to signal there were one learning community. We're not a community of two or three groups, depending on how we engage with the class, which is also where a synchronous element of my course, other courses would be important because it would create an opportunity for all students to engage regardless of how they're joining class session. Again, reinforcing this idea of one. We know from research on intergroup relations, this importance of being seen as one group, not multiple groups engaging in the course. And norms, expectations, critically important. I tell my students, any well-functioning community needs social norms. And I set our social norms for our community to develop and evolve into a strong learning community, transparently and aspirationally. So let me say a little bit more about that explicitly. On the very first day of class, I introduce what I joke and call our four C's framework of our community. And again, reaching out to students before the beginning of our course is incredibly helpful because I can honestly and openly tell my students that we have an incredible diversity in our class. I know because students have shared with me about their backgrounds and they have shared with me about their interests. So I can also tell students that we are all deeply curious about our course topic and we will pursue our curiosity collectively. This will be a co-construction of knowledge. And as we pursue collectively our curiosity, we need candor in our course because what good is it to have diverse perspectives and to have diverse experiences if we're not openly sharing them? if we're not bringing our genuine views to the table. Of course, that means we need to recognize that candor makes us vulnerable. And for us to be able to have that vulnerability, we need courtesy. We need to engage with ideas respectfully. I'll say more about that because this part is very important. And I tell students transparently that we will always, always ascribe good intentions in our course. We will ascribe respect. It doesn't mean that offense will never happen unintentionally. In fact, we know from research again that important conversations, meaningful important conversations often don't happen, not because we don't think that they are important, is precisely because we think they're so important 
that we're afraid to get them wrong. We are afraid to offend someone. We are afraid to come across, perhaps appearing less favorable than we'd like. And we need to acknowledge that. So that doesn't mean that we will never, again, unintentionally offend someone. And I use myself as an example. As Ima mentioned, I've been studying publishing in the area of diversity inclusion, very much thinking about ideas around bias. It doesn't mean that I'm myself immune to bias. We all have blind spots. That's why they're called blind spots. We're not aware. And the hope is that by coming together in such a way with very diverse views, we can become more aware of our own biases. And that takes courage, being willing, first of all, to share opinions, to share when something is also offensive. And perhaps it takes even more courage to be willing to listen and understand without being defensive, to share our perspectives, even when they might be in the minority, to listen to the opinions of others, even if they are different or even in opposition to ours. We might be coming from places where our opinions were the default. If that's the case, we might not even need to vocalize. Everyone already subscribed to them. We don't need to verbalize them. We don't need to explain them. Coming together in our virtual learning space might mean that we need to verbalize something for the first time. We need to explain something. We might hear other opinions for the first time. That's learning. And learning takes courage. And I very transparently share with students both our norms of how we're going to be learning together. And that also means addressing some of the barriers to open dialogue that fuels our learning, fear of judgment. I put it on the table right away. We all might have this fear of judgment, regardless of what we're teaching. Students might have this fear of judgment. Am I the only one who doesn't understand? Am I the only one with this opinion? I explicitly acknowledge this fear of judgment to my students on the first day. And I will tell them openly, I'm not even going to promise you that we will not judge because judgments happen. They happen automatically. We know this from research too. A lot of judgment happens automatically. It's an evolved response, friend or foe. Are we gonna be eaten? It's a lot of automatic judging. Even now, let's see. We've been on for half an hour. Oh my God, time flies. For half an hour here. I'm sure as you are watching and listening this webinar, you've made some of the judgments already about the webinar, about us, about me. What I ask my students, and that's much more effortful, is to circle back to our judgments. Why have you made the judgments you've made? What is it about the way maybe I speak, what I say, how I say, how I look, even some of the context, my background, what is influencing your judgment? And that's powerful learning right there. A lot of times thinking about what's influencing our judgments, perhaps even without our awareness, often tells us more about us even than about the person whom we're judging. I talk to my students about this, bringing in this research too. And I talk about pluralistic ignorance. I tell them, and I'll tell you, the term itself, you don't need to remember the term, but what's important is that the phenomenon is common enough to warrant the term, to warrant the research. And what this research says is that we might feel that we're the only one with this question, am I the only one not understanding the material? Am I the only one who has this view? And I tell students, you might be the only one who has this view. That's the beauty of diversity. We want to hear from you if you're the only one. But pluralistic ignorance means that you might not be the only one. 
we all might be sitting here thinking we are the only ones and nobody says anything. And we go on, continue thinking that we are the only ones. And that's how issues, important issues, don't get raised. Which is why I invite you to speak up. You might learn in the process, you're not the only one. Or you might learn that you're the only one. And that's the beautiful part of diversity. Which doesn't mean that it will be comfortable. I talk explicitly about discomfort. Again, discomfort might be the space where most learning happens. And we need to have a safe space for us to experience this discomfort, to be able to engage in meaningful discussions, in meaningful conversations, to feel safe. That means potentially learning that something we've said might be offensive. That also means that recognizing we don't always have opinions that are formed. So far we've been talking about like we all have opinions on everything. We might not. It might take us a couple of takes, maybe more than a couple of takes, to even verbalize and develop our opinions. That's where learning in the safe space is so important. Again, discomfort, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I'll talk more about that, how it applies not just to synchronous sessions, but also norms that accept them to our asynchronous community. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what happens outside of class, immediately before and after class or between classes. It's interesting to step back. As Marika mentioned, many of us have transitioned from being fully in the physical space to different variations, either fully online or some form of hybrid. Before we might have taken for granted the interactions that would take place before or after class. You come into the classroom, students might approach you, you might have conversations, other students might be having conversations on the side. If we are teaching, let's say for a moment, in a hybrid space that I've described early in my course, where some students are present physically in person, others are joining remotely. Students who are joining virtually cannot have multiple side conversations unless we assign them to breakout rooms. Similarly, they can't just come and approach an instructor. That means that we need to be much more thoughtful and much more purposeful. How do we structure our time before and after class to make sure we can carry one thread of a conversation to again include students in those conversations. And students who watch completely in recording, I know, and I'll tell a bit more when I talk about class annotations, how I know, but they also listen to what happens before and after class to make sure that we're not forgetting students who are watching completely in recording. So just being purposeful and mindful of how we structure those conversations. Now, let me say a little bit more about a synchronous component, starting with class annotations. For students who watch our class recordings, think about class annotations as a synchronous chat where students can watch the recording. And again, remember the instructions? I could even say, how do you vote? Is it a go? Is it a no go? Please pause the video and chat in. Why? And students can then asynchronously, there's a chat that would look just like your live chat, but it's in a synchronous chat and it's timestamped. So I know and other students who go and watch the recording know to which moment in the class session student comments can respond as they're answering those questions. And they can type in their responses specific to those timestamps. Other students who watch after can see how their classmates have responded which is why I tell all students, the way I told you, even if you're with us during our live session, go back just because our time ended in the session, similarly to the way our webinar will end, sadly. Doesn't mean we have to stop reflecting. You might have additional thoughts. You might have new insights. You might have new questions. You might also want to know what other students are typing in. Your classmates are responding to your comments, I tell my students. So we can engage again as one learning community through class annotations. 
I also go back and I read students asynchronous comments. And then it's very important to create this continuous loop of learning, continuous loop of learning. So I'll go and I'll look at those annotations and I will bring when relevant, some of these comments back into live session, perhaps giving voice to students who otherwise wouldn't have voice in our live sessions because they only watch in recording, they only engage asynchronously. And that's an important piece to this continuous loop of learning. Weekly reflections, very much along the lines of continuous learning. I use an example of weekly reflections as my asynchronous assignment. But what's important is that you think of what asynchronous assignment might be more aligned to your learning objectives. The key is to align our project to what we're trying to achieve in our course and be explicit about it with our students. So for my course, I use weekly reflections. And again, I talk to students about research on experiential learning. And I tell them that what we know is that what separates experience from experiential learning is the reflection piece. So we will practice applying what we are learning in our course to what's relevant and important to you. And that's where, again, diversity is so powerfully contributing to learning. The ways that students can apply our course concepts to their experiences, to their perspectives. And that makes it so much more powerful. And again, this weekly reflection component eliminates the boundaries of how students engage with the course because now they're all engaging with each other on their own time. And so as part of this assignment, I'm not only asking students to post their reflections, I'm also asking students to respond to other students' posts, at least a couple. And again, I'm very explicitly talking to them about process. We often don't talk enough about process. We jump into our classes, we jump into our learning without talking about how we're gonna be learning, why we have those projects, why is very important. You need to understand why as you think about your learning objectives and students need to understand why. Why are we doing it? And I tell students about the research around social ostracism, that it can be very painful if we feel excluded from a social group, especially if it's a meaningful social group like our class community. I talk to my students about this research and I tell them that as you are responding to your classmates' reflections, don't just re respond to the first reflection you see, scroll down. Maybe there's a classmate who doesn't have a response yet. Maybe there's a classmate with whom you haven't engaged yet. Be thoughtful of how you respond. And finally, group projects. Group projects can feel, ah, to many students. This is where, again, I explain why we're going to be doing group projects. In my course, it makes sense because we are talking about group processes. And so I tell my students, that it will allow us not only to learn about the content around group processes, but use that content to reflect on our own group processes through our group projects. And again, we bring those insights into our live sessions, continuous loop of learning. And because this group project's been so well received, especially for students who others might never be seen as individual learners, it really allows them to be seen and feel even more as part of our learning community, which is why I've also introduced optional group sessions where students, if they'd like, they can come together, let's say once a week, making sure that we account for time differences, making sure that we account for different responsibilities that students have, for students to come together informally and discuss topics around our course. And finally, and this is where I'll pause, office hours. Again, face-to-face, -face, being seen as individual learners and members of our learning community. Very, very important. Making sure that when we 
think about our office hours as instructors, we allow for time differences. We allow for student different responsibilities. And these hours have been so rewarding to hear from students. So I will pause here because I also wanna make sure that I get to hear from you and I'm checking the time. So we are great. Uh, hopefully that will give us time to hear. And yet again, if you have other questions that go, don't get answered, please reach out. You might think of other questions, reach out. Inma, I'm gonna pass it back to you now to see what questions we have from our participants here. And in the meantime, I will stop sharing the screen. All right, give me just one second. I will get oriented. <laughs> All right, yes, Ima, what questions do we have? Thank you very much, Dr. Sedloskaya, for your brilliant presentation and for sharing with us your work. You have inspired us with your reflections on diversity, inclusion, and belonging in virtual education environments. To get the ball rolling, I would like to start the Q&A section by asking you some questions raised by, uh, by, by people, by, by lecturers, by faculty members uh, from different universities that have been following I think very attentively your explanation. First, uh, we have a question from, I'm sorry if I'm not going to pronounce well your <laughs> name, so sorry for that. Um, I have a question from uh, Dr. Denise McAllister Weil from Maastricht University. Um, she, uh, she says the following, I've got uh, 1,500 students on one course. I send a group email welcoming them to the course, but responding to individual mails will be too time consuming. What would you like to, what would, would you propose? The same applies to the students' names. Um, we have a very similar question uh, also from, 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 from the Netherlands too, from Ian Wapereis, professor at the Open University of Netherlands, who says, um, what if you have a course with 500 students? Is such an, introdu is, is such an introduction feasible? Phenomenal questions. And I think that really highlights this dichotomy. On one hand, it is very time consuming to reach out to all students individually. What's also interesting in this, the other part of the dichotomy, that's where students, back to what Marika was talking about, where students might feel even more need to be seen as both individual learners and members of a learning community because there's so many students. It's so much easier to feel, again, just one in the sea of many. So how can we do that? Again, being also very pragmatic, I love those questions. We can't be pie in the sky. We need to recognize that we all have limits on our time. This is where I want to be very strategic in terms of how you might be bringing in experiences from students. If you are reaching out with a welcoming email and asking students to respond, which I know could be very overwhelming, but as you go through the course, perhaps you can be reading more and learning more about your students, bringing in their experiences into the course, even mentioning what I know goes a long way. If you mention someone's experience or reference someone's reflection, all students feel special because it's signaling to all students. So if I mention something like, in, my, in your reflection or in your introduction, you wrote X, Y, and Z. Not only Ima, but I know from research, but even Marika might feel, oh, the professor is looking at us individually. That matters to students. So if you can continuously throughout the course of your semester, be thoughtfully bringing in diverse student perspectives, even if you don't bring in all your thousand students, that signals that you value their experiences and also creating thoughtful the space for students to engage with each other in ways that would benefit from their unique perspectives. Diversity, I mean, if you think about 500 students, that's a lot of diverse perspectives and experiences. How we can create a space for students to learn. You might divide them into groups, but thinking purposefully what makes sense for you to make sure you give voice to these diverse perspectives. Ima, I'm gonna turn it to you. But again, I'm also looking to your reflections. 
how much it makes sense, what other thoughts that evokes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. We have so many questions coming from the chat that um, I, I'm going to keep going um, to, give, to give them voice. Um, we have a question from a colleague from uh, the EUC, uh, Dr. Monica Serdan, in the intersection of team working and uh, di functional diversity. She's, she, was like, she would like to know your, your impression about the following. Working groups could be challenging when a student is on the spectrum or with a mental illness. Could you pl please provide us with some related tips? Yes, and in fact, I think this is so important to think about. I actually supervised a research thesis from one of my students whose work specifically went into teams, especially teams that includes neurodiverse students. And I think, first of all, the framing. As we think about diversity, how do we even think about neurodiversity? And thinking about that as diversity of ways to think, ways to bring in what are their strengths that they're contributing is very, very important, recognizing how we think about the team and almost what is our default. How, you know, is it that we need to accommodate for students or, which I think is not the optimal way to think about it, or are we optimizing for diversity, including neurodiversity? Because these are the students. It's very similar to this analogy. At which point, for example, our differences in height become more than just differences and become disabilities. For example, if I'm very tall or conversely, if I'm very short, I mean, it's just a difference. But if all the doorknobs, for example, are set at a very high level where I can't reach, now my difference becomes a disability. So how do we create space where we don't just accommodate for people who can't reach the doorknob? How do we create a space where we can actually benefit from this diversity? And that means thinking very creatively. First of all, framing what that means and thinking very openly and very creative with students. How can we benefit from diverse teams? Because actually, it is not just specific to neurodiversity. We know from research that yes, diverse teams tend to outperform, but not always, not always. Under just simple default circumstances, homogeneous teams actually perform better because there are no differences. They can be much more, let's say, time efficient. It's only when we create the environment where we frame it, that we have diverse perspectives, we have diverse abilities, and we provide the environment in which we can actually thrive, that's when the diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams. So to me, I think it's framing. When we have neurodiverse individuals and teams, for everyone, how do we work together to allow for all diversity to shine through? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, we have a couple of questions related to um, to the use of technology in education and how it will be helpful to deal with diversity. Um, for example, John from the University of Wyoming is a, would like to know a little bit about how uh, extended reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence could be used in education and could help us in the topic we are dealing today. And also we have um, Maxine Gonzalez from the Open University of Catalonia, who would like to know if uh, technology could help um, accessibility or incorporating accessibility into the, into the platforms without having to ask for accommodations. Thank you. First of all, let me just say overarchingly that my view on technology, I think it is a combination of pedagogy and technology, where technology supports our purposeful pedagogy. So I just want to make that out there, that I always think that technology is there to support the pedagogy and allow us to do that. I mean, even use us now as an example, again, we are able to create this diversity. Again, huge thanks to all of our interpreters right now, making this possible. And again, framing this, I want to go back, framing it, so I'm answering the second question first, um, this, idea, this, this idea of recency effect. Um, so framing this not as accommodating, 
what I just talked about before. It's not that now that all the doorknobs are set, hi, I need to bring the stool in and accommodate. It's how do we create that space? And this is maybe the difference in equality and equity, right? With this idea, and then there's another step where we don't need different stools, we just remove the barrier that, that would necessitate this different height stools in the first place. So how do we create a space where we don't need to say, oh, in my, and for you, we'll do X. That requires purposeful pedagogy, whether we're thinking about course design, whether we're thinking about materials, the way we present materials, the way we really center around participants. Again, framing back to the question earlier, neurodiversity, rather than accommodating for neurological disabilities, framing is so important. It's diversity and it powerfully enhances everyone's learning. Let me now also quickly address this question about technology and potential virtual reality. To the same umbrella, technology in support of purposeful pedagogy. What are our learning objectives and how can we use technology to support it? For example, even there are simulations to show the power of diversity and also maybe some of the challenges that we don't even recognize. If we're in the majority, goes back to the idea of accommodations. For example, language barriers, um, or knowing that some of our students might need the extra second to formulate the thought if it's not in their language, raise the hand that requires extra thought. There are some simulations that allow students who are native speakers to experience some of the challenges that international students experience to really allow students to develop this empathy. This is an example of the technology that allows for those simulations for us to learn, for us as instructors. Going back to this question, how do we create an inclusive environment rather than accommodation? Sometimes it's literally as simple as waiting an extra second before we call on someone, recognizing that we have different challenges and that also with those challenges come great opportunities. Ima, please. Oh, yes, uh, I have another <laughs> question, a very different one, uh, coming from Dr. Gisela Medier, Associate Professor at the UOC. She says, uh, the use of role models is a common practice among entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystems. And narratives tend to show a successful superwoman in both her personal and professional life. However, such image comes from a very individualistic and even, even utopic view of the society where everybody has the same opportunities and conditions. Thus, uh, how can we use women role models in teaching uh, while avoiding their limitations? That's another question wow. where I feel we can have the whole <laughs> webinar um, on this. In fact, mm -hmm. every question I feel could be yes. a long webinar, so you can probably feel my tension of wanting to address questions, but also mm -hmm. making sure that I do it substantively. At Harvard Business School, I don't know how familiar you are with the pedagogy, we use case methods. So this idea of, you know, you call them role models, we call them protagonists, which is not the same thing, um, mm -hmm. but this idea of how do we think about protagonists? How realistic are the protagonists? This idea, right? We, I can do it, we all can do it. I think that's where First of all, be mindful of whom we're picking, but more importantly is the discussions that we're having. It's surfacing some of the issues. Again, could be our blind spots. What is it we're taking for granted that others might not take for granted? And sometimes as instructors, this goes back to my own expectation setting. We might think about many issues. We might not think about all of the issues, which is why it is a power of diversity. That's how my students say. Yes, but not everybody has access to this, or even what we've taken at a very for granted basic level isn't necessarily the case in other cultures. Giving voice to students, making issues discussable, and making sure that we're not paralyzed. Because if we're looking for the perfect role model who can address many, many, many things, we might never find one. But opening up discussion to students and thinking about those nuances, thinking about what we call in research moderating variables and boundary conditions, that's where student voices and diverse perspectives really powerfully come into play. 
This is my and pause, and it's a cue. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very, very useful. Your reflection. I think yes, we need to put it in practice. Absolutely, yes. Um, there is a very different question coming from Dr. Antonina Sagiartola, a professor at the Open University of Catalonia, too. He says, despite the abundance of evidence of e-learners' differences and challenges. Diversity in digital environments seems to be fairly overlooked in academic research. What could be, could be your inputs on this? What could be, what could be emerging issues in e-inclusion research? Well, that's a great study. question. <laughs> that's a great question to ask when we have a minute left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, like what can we be studying uh, with this ever I think in general, because I know I'm very mindful of the time and our culture, we talk about cultural differences, our culture is that we always start and end on time, which again doesn't mean that our conversation needs to end permanently. But let me just say that what I'm hoping, because the way the research works, right? Research informs practice, but practice also informs research. And I want to maybe go where Marika had us started because I know some of you have already been doing online virtual teaching for a very long time. Others are just transitioning. The pandemic has perhaps facilitated this transition where more and more and more of us are thinking more purposefully around pedagogy. And I think that is what's really now gonna start both motivating and fueling research and really starting the cycle. And I know we're exactly at the time. So, but I think what I wanna end here is again, this idea of continuous research practice, practice research cycle. And we talked this whole webinar about student virtual learning, but where I've started is this idea of being able to come together and learn as educators and as scientists and as researchers are thinking, what are those gaps that now we can collectively start feeling to enhance our practice and learning from the practice, applying back to research. I know I have not answered your question directly, but I would very much like for us to continue thinking and having conversations on this topic. Exactly on the dot. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I see. Thank you. I'm so sorry because time is up and there are some other questions, but we need to stop here. Um, so I would like to thank you again, Dr. Sedlovskaya, for making this webinar a real success. And thank you also the VU University in Amsterdam and our partners in the e-inclusion project for your collaboration in this webinar. And a big, big thank you to everyone for attending and for your active, active participation. It has been great. We very much look forward to seeing you at the next webinars at the UOC will be organizing. Last but not least, we would like to ask you to answer the satisfaction survey that is available on the platform. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you.